Welcome back to MET 1213, Section 7, Applications of Map in Today's World. Today is day number 24 in week number 12. We have two more weeks to go for this semester. And then you have to finish one project, and after that, you have to finish the final exam. The project is going to give you 20 points, and it should not be difficult. Because the idea of the project is to help you to explore the applications of what you learn in a context which is easy for you to understand. And you determine the question. You determine how to solve it. And so what you need to do is to present, submit, better say, a proposal, submit a report, and submit a PowerPoint. You do not need to present it. The proposal is not more than one page long. Tell what question it is based on what concept. For example, if you're doing optimizations using the derivative, it's very simple. You're doing the minimizations or the maximization of something. We continue so today. And then you need to construct the solutions of the problem using your report. The report library cannot be more than 10 pages long, including the sources. Okay? The method of solutions. I will give you some typical examples today. All right? And then you need to include a PowerPoint of how you present the problem, how you solve the problem. You just need to submit these three important artifacts individually, although the whole team of your, all the members of your team will submit the same items, but you have to submit it individually. Okay? And after you submit them individually, all the members of the same team will receive the same grade. Okay? Lot only 20% is not that difficult. Now, what kind of things you can produce? Today, and that's actually, I've been doing this for many weeks, but it is up to now that I have to point this out to you. You have not the resources that you can use. For example, if I am with you, and if I happen to have formulated this particular problem, let's take a look at the problem, okay? This problem is based on optimizations in calculus using the applications of the derivative. So let's take a look at the problem. The problem is very simple, okay? There are many factors to consider in food packaging, very daily lifestyle, including marketing, including durability cost and material. In this problem, we would like to minimize the cost of material for a can. For example, a camper soup is put in a can, and you buy the camper soup in the form of canvas soup. Find the height and radius of a particular can that could minimize the surface area of a can whose volume is one liter, which is equivalent to one thousand centimeter. Is it a difficult problem? No. Is it a problem that could be considered as a proposal? Yes. It's as simple as that. But it must be a problem that has been discussed by members of your team, and you know how to solve it. Okay. And once you solve it, you have to structure your problem in the form of a proposal. So what else can you add to this information if you want to make this as your proposal? You need to add some sources. For example, textbook of calculus, chapters in the calculus which talks about optimization of something. Okay? Or a similar example from the web. You can include some web links such as the Collins Academy's optimization problem which you can easily find in the UN window environment. So, could I invite you to spend five to ten minutes on your table to solve this problem? Can you solve this problem? We're going to solve several problems today. Okay? You do not need to calculate everything, but you need to know the approach used to solve this problem. So, related rates or you need some relationships. It talks about the volume. What's the volume of the can? You need to know how to calculate the volume of the can. Now, we need to minimize.
minimize the cost of the material for this can in the context of a surface area. How do you calculate the surface area of a can? Internally or externally? So think about this, and then we'll come back to this in five minutes, okay? You need to do something like this. I do not mean you need to think of a very crazy problem. Okay, this is the simplest kind of problem you can propose. All right? This means you know how to solve problem of this type with the specific learning that you learn from calculus. All right? The derivative using the idea of what? The tangent to the curve at that particular point is equivalent to looking up the slope of that particular curve and set the slope to zero and because the knowledge behind of setting it to zero will help us to find critical numbers and the critical numbers can give us possible solutions for the maximum point and minimum point and the minimum point is to minimize the course right so it's a very useful set of concepts. Okay, spend five minutes here, and then we'll look into... Yes. Can you magnify it? We can magnify this. Magnify. Oh, sure, sure. That's what I'm supposed to do, but I, I need to make sure I understand what you mean.
We conclude that the critical point R is equal to this probably represents the minimum surface area. And to be sure, you need to calculate H and estimate the size of the cavity. This is a very important step. One liter is 1,000 1, cubic centimeters. So R is equal to this, okay, approximately equal to 5 centimeter and H equal to 11 centimeter. Why reasonable? And this is about the same size as the bottom half of a 2 liter bottle. So, six, nine, a reasonable answer. This much discussion is very important in the constructions of your solutions. It tells us that you know how to reason from what you learned from calculus in the applications of derivative. All right? You don't just become a calculating machine and write this out without thinking. So, the project in order to give you a good, good score for your project, I will take a look at the reasoning. Okay, it's not difficult, just step by step. All right, so this is one example. Let's take a look at another example called related grids. An optimizations problem using implicit differentiations. When implicit differentiation is involved, not only the the expressions, the equations, is for more than one variable, okay? So let's take a look at the problem today. Suppose you wish to build a grain silo, grain silo, okay? Something like a container, okay? With volume V, which is made of a steel cylinder, and a hemispherical root. So a cylinder here with a hemispherical root. Okay, if you can imagine it. The steel sheets covering the surface of the silo, the container, are quite expensive. So we have to calculate the cost. You wish to minimize again the surface area of your silo. Alright? So what height and radius should the silo have for given volume to V, for given bottom V, what is the height and radius? Similar to the first question. Although it's possible to solve this problem by the same method used in the can design questions, that tells you a little bit of a challenge. It turns out to be much simpler to use implicit differentiations to find the derivative of a surface area with respect to radius. Now answer this question for, a very good suggestion, a silo with a circular floor to keep out gophers, and a silo with no built-in flooring for use in regions with no gophers. Now you check what is meant by a gophers, all right? So it's a very interesting problem. You know it. You work on a similar problem before, but think a little bit about this. You see, implicit differentiations. That means you do not need to work out H in terms of R or R in terms of H. You just do the differentiations directly on both sides. Alright? So I'll give you about five to ten minutes time this time to try to work this problem out. You should have the ability to work this out. Okay? Your project is nothing more than something like this. Okay? You need to get the something here. And one more thing that I need to remind you. The final exam is on December the 18th, Friday, from 9.30 to 11.30. The location is e, E2G007. And I was just re I have, I have just been reminded by one of you. Uh, we will be having the final exam in the other sections of this course. Okay? This is section 7. You will meet students from section 5 or 1 to 2. But you are writing the paper of section 7. If you don't write a paper in any other sections. If you write a paper in any other sections, I cannot help you. Alright? Make sure to check the paper that I deliver to you. It's section 7, alright? Don't write any other paper. There are many papers there. Okay? One teacher teach 
three or four other sections. So I know that many students will write the same question paper. But for our course here, you write the paper for section seven, okay? Don't write any other paper. Because we're different papers, all right? Normally, I would deliver the paper at that, that time. And don't pick up any other section's paper and write it and give it to me that you will be in big trouble. Okay, that's good. The project is not difficult. Make sure you you, you do something, okay? And just keep giving you all these problems to make sure you feel familiar with optimizations problems. Remember, you just learned the first part of calculus for differential calculus based on looking up the slope of the particular curve. We've not done anything on integrations yet. Try and try the best you could just express the relationships uh, between the bottom and the height and the radius, and also uh, between surface area and height and radius using typical formulas. Again, the first task is to draw a sketch of the site. This will help us to find the formula for the total surface area and the volume. The sinus will have some radius R, and the cylindrical wall will have some height H. The sinus, including a circular floor, will be given the relation to its follow. Circumference times height, the um, uh, two particular top and the bottom area, uh, and then pi r square again, right? The surface area of the sinus of cylindrical wall is the circumference of the base times the height, which is this one. The surface area of the roof will be half times 4 pi r squared, because it's a, uh, it's a spherical atmosphere, okay? And the floor will have surface area pi r squared, uh, hence, the surface area of a sino with the floor is given by the first one, the second one, which is this one, and the last one, which is this one, okay, the floor. The bottom of the cylinder will be pi r squared h, and the bottom of the atmospherical attic, the atmospherical attic will be half times a quarter divided by uh, quarter, a uh, three quarter times pi r squared. The total volumes of the cylinder will be V equal to pi r squared h plus two third pi r cube. Now, so once you got this relationship, you're well set. We can use this equation to determine that h is equal to two r divided by three minus V divided by pi r squared, and then substitute this into the expression for the surface area, just as the can problems did. But the resulting equations, it's quite impressive. Instead, we find implicit differentiations to the formula for surface area. And so we got something like this. 
We're differentiating SA with respect to R, and so you got this relationships on the other side. So once we got through that, we use implicit differentiations on the formula for bottom. So both bottom and the surface area. And we got something like this. Okay? Because we need to set this to zero. And so we switch terms. And so we got dh by dr in this particular fraction. This is a relationship. Okay? Rate of change of high with respect to all. And practically this into the formula for this we got the following relationships. And so, we can see that if we set the surface area, this is equal to zero exactly. All we have when H is equal to R equal to this particular values. So, is this a minimum? We need to test it. No other critical points and extreme outcomes are at all being cited. Is it possible for us to do something like this with an extremely large surface area or some wise cycle as the height approaches to zero and the radius approaches this? So after using the bottom formula to find expressions for R in terms of V the bottom, we see that in the case of H is equal to zero, we got the following relationship. So when H is equal to R equal to this, we got the following. So we all have to check, and the answer is quite simple, all right? So it's quite simple. So the solution in which R equal to H has the least surface area, okay? Note that the zero rate of this side note is a rectangle with a semi-circle on top, which is closer to the shape of a water, or oi tan than that of the side note. So the tall, thin silos actually use the store grain, take up less land area, leaving more room for farmland or other soils. <coughs> what about the other one? A silo with an open floor, okay? Open floor. So if you come back to this, the relationship you repeated one more time, this time you <coughs> got a very interesting result. Okay, so you need to test it and use the reasoning that's given here. The reasons I would like you to study this is because they gave you not just the calculations. The calculation is just a mechanical part. It's the interpretations using the concept you should have learned. Okay, the interpretation step by step. When I look at the paper you write in during the midterm exam, of course during the midterm is another thing. But you have to make sure you're applying the concept, you're applying the reasoning, okay? That is how we measure your ability to apply maps in the, in the everyday world. We do expect you to know a lot of maps. We expect you want to know something. You can deeply use them in applying the knowledge you learn in typical problems of this time, all right? It's the thinking. It's a mindset that is very important. Okay, now, I have given you two typical examples today. Let's learn a little bit more before we come to... The following content is provided under a creative Something more. license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Today, we're going to keep on going with related rates. And you may recall the last time we were in the middle of a, uh, of a problem with this geometry. There was a right triangle, there was a road, which is going this way, from right to left, and the police were up here, monitoring the situation, 30 feet from the road, and you're here, and you're heading this way, it's a uh, 
maybe it's a two-lane highway, but anyway, it's only going this direction. And this distance was 50 feet. So uh, because you're moving, this distance is varying, and so we gave it a letter. And similarly, your distance to the foot of the perpendicular with the road is also varying. At this instant, it's 40, because this is a 3, 4, 5 right triangle. So this was the situation that we were in last time, and we're going to pick up where we left off. The question is, are you speeding? If the rate of change of d with respect to t is 80 feet per second, now technically that would be minus 80 because you're coming, you're going towards the, the policeman, all right? So D is shrinking at a rate of minus 80 feet per second. And I remind you that 95 feet per second is approximately the speed limit, which is 65 miles per hour. So again, this is where we were last time. And There. And so let's uh, solve this question, this problem. All right, so this is the setup. There's a right triangle. So there's a relationship between these lengths. And the relationship is that x squared plus 30 squared is equal to d squared. So that's the, the first relationship that we have. And the second relationship that we have, we've already written down which is dx dt, oops, sorry, dd dt is equal to minus 80. All right? Now, the idea here is relatively straightforward. We just want to use uh, differentiation. Now, you could, you could solve for x. All right, x is the square root of d squared minus 30 squared. All right, that's one possibility. But this is, this is basically a waste of time. It's a waste of your time. So, so it's easier or easiest to follow this method of implicit differentiation, which I want to encourage you to get used to. Namely, we just differentiate this equation with respect to time. Now, when you do that, you have to remember that you are not allowed to plug in a constant, namely 40, for t. You have to keep in mind what's really going on in this problem, which is that x is moving, it's changing, and d is also changing. So you can't, you have to differentiate first before you plug in the values. So the easiest thing is to use, in this case, an implicit differentiation. And if I do that, I get 2x dx dt is equal to 2d dd dt. No more ddt left, we hope, but except in this blackboard. All right, so there's our situation. Now, if I just plug in, now I can plug in in values. So this is after taking the derivative. And indeed, we have here 2 times the value for x, which is 40 at this instant. And then we have dx dt. And that's equal to 2 times d, which is 50. And then dd dt is minus 80. All right? So the 80s cancel, and we see that dx dt is equal to minus 100 feet per second. So the answer to the question is yes. Although probably wouldn't be pulled over for this much of a violation. All right. So that's right. It's more than 65 miles an hour by a little bit. Okay. So that's the end of this question. And usually in these rate of change or related rates questions, this is considered to be the answer to the question. All right, so that's one example. I'm going to give one more example before we go on to some other uh, applications of, uh, of uh, implicit differentiation.
So my second example is going to be, you have a, uh, it, it is a, a conical tank. Okay. With top of radius four feet, let's say, and depth ten feet. Okay, so that's our situation. And then um, it's being filled with water. So it's being filled with water at two cubic feet per minute. All right, so there's our, our situation. And then the question is, uh, how fast is the water rising when it is at depth um, five feet. So if this thing is half full, in the sense, well, not, not half full in terms of total volume, but half full in terms of height, uh, what's, the, uh, what's the speed at which the water is running? Okay, so how do we set up problems like this? Well, we talked about this last time. The first step is, is to set up a diagram of variables. And I'm just going to draw the picture. I'm actually going to draw the picture twice. It's a very good question. So here's the conical tank. And we have this radius, which is 4. And we have this height, which is 10. So that's just to allow me to think about this problem. Now, it turns out, because we have a, a, a varying depth and so on, and, 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 and this is just the top, that I'd better depict also the level at which the water actually is present. And furthermore, it's better to do this schematically, as you'll see. So the key point here is to draw this triangle here, which shows me the 10 and shows me the 4 I over here. For a and then imagine that I'm filling it part way. So we'll, maybe we'll put that water level in another color here. So here's the, the water level. And the water level, I'm going to depict that horizontal distance here as r. That's going to be my variable. That's the radius of the top of the water. So I'm taking a cross section of this because that's geometrically the only thing I have to keep track of, uh, at least initially. All right. So this is this is a water level, and it's really uh, 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 rotated around. But I'm depicting just this one half slice of the of the picture. And then similarly, I have the height, which is this. Uh, dimension there, that, that, or if you like, the depth of the water. So the water has filled us up, <coughs> up to this point. So I set it up this way so that it's clear that we have two triangles here, and that one piece of information we can get from the geometry is the similar triangles information. Namely, that r divided by h is equal to 4 divided by 10. Okay? So this is by far the most uh, typical geometric fact that you'll have to glean from a picture. Okay? So that's, that's one, one piece of information that we get from this picture. Now, the second thing we have to do is set up formulas for the volume of water, and then figure out what's going on here. So the volume of water is of a cone. So again, you have to know something about geometry to do many of these problems. So you have to know that the volume of a cone is one-third base times height. Now this one is upside down. The base is on the top. It's going down, but it works the same way. That doesn't affect volume. So it's one-third, and the base is pi r squared, that's the base, and times h, which is, which is the height. All right, so this is the setup 
for this problem. And now, having our relationship, we have one, one relationship left that we have to remember because we have one more piece of information in this problem, namely how fast the volume is changing. It's going in two cubic feet per minute. It's increasing. So that means that dvdt is two. All right, so I've now gotten rid of all the words, and I have only formulas left. All right, I started here with the words. I drew some pictures, and I drew some formulas. Actually, there's one thing missing. What, what's missing? Exactly. What you want to find. What I left out is the question. So the question is, what is dH dt when h is equal to 5? Right? So that's, that's the question here. All right? Now we've got the whole problem, and we never have to look at it again, if you like. We just have to pay attention to the uh, to, to, to this piece here. All right, so let's carry it out. So what happens here? So, so look, you could do this by implicit differentiation, but it's so easy to express r as a function of h that that seems kind of foolish. So let's like write r is two fifths h. All right, that's coming from this first equation here, and then let's substitute that in. That means that v is equal to a third pi times two-fifths h squared times h. And now I have to differentiate that. So now I will use implicit differentiation. It's very foolish at this point to take cube roots and to solve for h. You just get yourself into a bunch of junk. So there is a stage at which we're still using implicit differentiation here. I'm not going to try to solve for h as a function of v. Instead of just differentiating straight out from this formula, which is relatively easy to differentiate, so this is dv dt, which of course is 2, is equal to, and if I differentiate it, I just get this constant, pi over 3, this other constant, 2 fifths squared, and then I have to differentiate h cubed, right? h squared times h. So that's 3 h squared times dh dt. That's the chain. All right, so now let's plug in all of our numbers. Again, the other theme is you don't plug in numbers, uh, 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 fixed numbers, until everything has stopped moving. At this point, we've already calculated our rates of change. So now I can put in the numbers. So 2 is equal to pi over 3 times 2 fifths squared times 3. And then h was 5, so this is 5 squared. And then I have dh dt. There's only one unknown thing left in this problem, which is dh dt. Everything else is a number. And if you do all the cancellations, you see that this cancels this. One of the twos cancels. Well, this cancels this. And then one of the twos cancels that. So all told, what we have here is that um, dh dt is equal to 1 over 2 pi. Right? And so that happens to be feet per second. Also. All right? Question, way back. Uh, where did I get, the question is, where did I get r equals 2 fifths h from? The answer was, it came from similar triangles, which is over here. I did this similar triangle thing, and I got this relationship here. r divided by h is equal to 4 tenths, but then I canceled and got 2 fifths. So, so, and brought the H over. Uh, another question over here. The question was the following. Suppose you're at this stage, can you write from here DVDH? So suppose you're here and work out what this is, which is it's going to end up to be some constant times 
times h squared, and then also use dvdt, which is equal to dvdh times dhdt, which is the chain. Okay? And the answer is yes. We can do that, and indeed, that is what my next sentence is. That's exactly what I'm saying. So when I said this, so I'm sorry, when you said this, I did that. That's exactly what I did. This chunk is exactly dv dh. That's just what I'm doing. Okay? So definitely, that's that's what I what I had in mind. Yeah, another question. Uh, you're asking me whether my arithmetic is right or not. What? Pi per second. Oh, this should be. No, okay, right. I guess it's per minute, since the other one's per minute. Thank you. Yes. Was there another question? Probably also fixing my seconds to minutes. Way back. Um, I don't understand. Why did you have to do all that? Isn't the speed two cubic feet per minute? Uh, the speed at which you're filling it is two cubic feet, but the water level is rising at a different rate depending on whether you're low down or high up. It depends on how wide the pond, the, the surface is. So in fact, it's not. In fact, the answer wasn't two cubic feet. It wasn't. That, there's a rate there. That is, that's how much volume is being added. But then there's another number that we're keeping track of, which is the height, or if you like, the depth of the water. Okay? So this is the whole point about related rates, is you have one variable, which is V, which is volume of something. You have another variable, which is H, which is the height of the cone of water there. And you're keeping track of one variable in terms of the other. And the relationship will always be a chain rule type of relationship. So therefore, you'll be able, if you know one, you'll be able to figure out the other provided you get all of the related rates. These are what are called related rates. This is a rate of something with respect to something, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really all about the chain rule. And just fitting it to, uh, to uh, word problems. All right? So there's uh, a couple of examples, and uh, I'll let you work out some more. All right, so now, the next thing that I want to do is to give you one more max min problem, which is has to do with this uh, device which I brought with me. So this oh, is yeah. a ring. It happens to be a max min ring. Here. Here. This is some here. And then go back here and do some exercise at this point. Now let's say during this. Let's try this problem. I want to make sure you have a good revision. So Hi, everybody. Welcome back to recitation. In lecture, we did a bunch of examples of related rates problems. So I have a couple more for you to do today. Um, so here we've got, OK, so we've got air being blown into a spherical balloon at a rate of 1,000 cubic centimeters per second. So the question is, how fast is the radius growing when the radius is equal to 8 centimeters? And then, okay, so I've got a second question, which is about how fast is the surface area that's growing at that same time. So why don't you take a few minutes, work this one out for yourself, come back, and we'll work it out together. Now, please work on this problem. Just have enough preparations for that at this point. Related rates, okay? When you think about your project, when you try to formulate some questions of interest, it could be as simple as this, using what you learn, all right? Instead of thinking outside, whatever you can, just put it on the focus of what you learn. What relationship do you need? What sum of the formulas do you need? Okay? The last question asked by the lady in the lecture is that Blake said, oh, when R is equal to XCM, why do we need to find out how fast the rate is growing? Okay? Similar to these questions. Okay. I hope you can 
practice to get familiar with this kind of questions with 10 minutes per question if we be good enough. All right, welcome back. So this question, like all related rates questions, has the property that the calculus is typically very straightforward, um, but that there's some <clears throat> geometric or algebraic set. So in this, in this case, it's, it's straight up geometry. Um, so we have a balloon. We know it's a perfect sphere. We know how fast the volume is changing. So okay, so we need, but we need to know how fast the radius is changing. So in order to do that, we need to figure out a relationship between the radius and the volume, and then we can just do implicit differentiation like we've been doing. So for example, okay, so so for a sphere, all right, this this the setup not so bad for this, this first one. Right? So we know that for a sphere, the volume is equal to four thirds pi times the radius. So that's the, the you know relation the, the fundamental relationship between the volume and radius of a sphere, and it's true for every sphere everywhere in the 
in space. And we're given also that the volume is changing at a constant rate of 1,000 centimeters cubed per second. So dv dt is just given to be a fast, you know, to be um, So the question is, what is dr dt? That's what we're trying to figure out. We're trying to figure out how fast the radius is changing at the moment when the radius is equal to 8 seconds. So how can we do that? Well, this, this fundamental relationship, it's an identity, it always holds. So that means we can differentiate it. Um, so if we take the derivative of this identity, well, v on the left just becomes dv dt. And on the right, we want to do implicit differentiation. So here, r is changing with respect to time. r is a function of t. Well, OK, so 4 thirds pi is a constant. So that is when we differentiate happens 4 thirds pi. And so now we differentiate r cubed with respect to t. So that gives us 3r squared times dr dt. So that's just the chain rule in action. Okay? And now what we want is this dr dt. Right? That's, that's the thing that we're looking for, is how fast the radius is growing. So that's dr dt. And we want it at the moment when r is equal to 8. So when r is equal to 8, this implies that, well, okay, so dv dt is 1,000 always. And it implies that, okay, so it's equal to 1,000 is equal to 4 thirds pi times 3 times 8 squared times the r. So at this moment that we're interested in, we have this equation to solve for dr dt, and this is a nice simple equation to solve. You just divide it by everything on the right hand side other than dr dt. So this implies that dr dt is equal to, well, okay, so I have to divide 1,000 by all this stuff. I think it works out to something like 125 over 32 pi. So that's the exact value. Maybe you're interested in sort of knowing about how large this is. So, so well, 32 pi is pretty close to 100, so this would have 1.2 something. So, all right, so there we go. So that answers the first question. At that moment, the, the radius is growing at a rate of 125 over 32 pi centimeters per second. Okay, so now how about the second question that we've got here? What about the surface area? So again, we, we know how fast now the radius is changing, and we know how fast the volume is changing. So in order to figure out how fast the surface area is changing, we need something that relates the surface area to either the volume or the radius. Now, the relationship between surface area and volume is something that we could sort of work out if we had to, but it's a lot easier to write down the surface area in terms of the radius. So let's do that. Um, so we have, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the letter S to denote the surface area of the sphere. So again, it's a general identity, you know, geometric fact that the surface area of a sphere is equal to four pi times the radius squared. This is always true. And now the thing that we want is the rate of change in the surface area. So the rate of change is the derivative. So we want to compute the derivative here, uh, ds dt. So OK, so we just do it. So ds dt is equal to well, 4 pi hangs around. And again, we, we differentiate r squared. So we have to, r is a function of t. So we have to use the chain rule here. So this is times 2r times dr. So this is an identity, so this is true always. And now we want to know, at this particular moment in time, when r is equal to 8, what is the s of t? And in order to figure that out, well, okay, so we, we just have to be able to plug in for everything else. So, so when r equals 8, all right, well, luckily, now if we, if we were just starting this problem from scratch here, we'd have a problem, which is we wouldn't know what the r of t was. But luckily, we've already figured it out. Right? So in, in the first part of the problem. So we know that when r is equal to 8, the r dt is equal to 125 over 
32 pi. Did I copy that right? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, so, okay, so in this case, the equation we have to solve is just completely straightforward. We just plug in the balance. It's already solved for us. Um, so that's nice. Um, so that we get the ds dt at that moment is equal to, well, okay, so it's 4 pi times 2 times 8 is the radius times 125 over 32 pi. Oh boy, and all right, so we can work this out if we want. I guess that's the third pi to cancel. So that's equal to 250, and I guess the units there better be centimeters squared. So at this moment in time, the surface area is growing by 250 centimeters squared. So that's all we have to do, so we're all set. So may I invite you to go home to make sure that you take a good look at the other two problems here, the sliding ladder, the quadratic approximations of a product, and Newton's method. Of course, let me give you a hint. We have not touched lecture number 14 yet, okay? But it's good for you to take a look at the problem first, and then we come back to that. We will not do a lot of the integration stuff in this course. Instead, I'm going to give you a little bit of the applications of mathematics in the following two weeks uh, from different contexts, okay? Uh, including, you are going to attend a lecture, which I believe is one of the funniest not funny, it's the most useful lecture that I ever attend over the video, all right? So that's it for today, and I hope that when you get back next week, all the teams from each of the table will have some problem that you want to become your group's project problem. Well, in this week and the past week, we invite you to think of the optimization problem the exponential applications, the logarithmic applications, all of these are very useful, okay? And now, uh, I will invite you to take a look at exponential functions again next week, all right? So, that's it. Welcome back. Remember, this is week number 12. We have two more weeks to go. December, is the time when you have to submit the work for your project. Don't forget, the submission link is already there. Okay? The submission link is already there. Which is starts from November the 21st up to November the 27th. Okay? And, oh yes, I remember this important news. Two days ago, we resolved of our academic staff received an email from the uh, Vice Director of Academic Affairs. And um, I'm very much happy to say that, starting from this semester, the official course evaluations could be done online by each one of you, okay? And what I would like to do is towards the end of the uh, semester, I will single off at least half an hour in the class, and you will go into that length of physics to make sure you finish it, okay? That is the best way to get it done. Now, you do not need to have someone holding a packet here delivered to you and have that someone go to another class and confuse all the packets in the software now. Electronically, it's excellent. All right? So, but I will set up a similar survey um, on the very last week uh, on Moodle to make sure you have a try first. Okay? Thank you very much.